The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. This indictment of George III from the United States Declaration of Independence has echoed down the centuries. His reputation in Jaws as a cartoonishly simple, stubborn, aspiring tyrant whose reign ended with a descent into madness. The real story, though, is somewhat different, as we shall discover. George became king at the age of 22. He was the first of the Hanoverian monarchs to have been born in England. Convince this nation you are not only an Englishman born and bred, his father advised, but that you are also this by inclination. George took this to heart, proclaiming to Parliament, I glory in the name of Britain. For the next 60 years, George ruled as he fought a patriot king should, defending the constitution and setting a moral example for the nation. The trouble was that George and his critics, on both sides of the Atlantic, had very different ideas about the rights of the monarch, parliament and the colonies. British radicals and American patriots were alike convinced that George and his ministers were attempting to undermine the constitution and subvert liberties. As Professor Harry Dickinson explains, radicals could point to the abuse of general warrants, attempts to muzzle the press and troop violence against crowds of demonstrators. Then there was the refusal of Parliament in 1768 and 1769 to accept the clear and repeated verdict of Middlesex voters in support of the radical John Wilkes. As a pro-reform newspaper commented at the time, the cause of liberty in England and America is one cause. The attacks on both have been made by the same men with the same views and with the same illegal violence. Domestically though, George's primary objective according to Professor Franco Gorman, was not absolutism, but rather to free the monarchy from what he imagined to be its humiliating subjection to the great Whig ministers. The Whigs had long dominated parliament and government posts, and they had a history of neutering kings, having orchestrated the glorious revolution of 1688 that removed James II. In George's view, the Whigs were corrupt and had used government patronage to hold on to power and enslave the monarchy. In ushering in a new generation of political leaders, intervening in the lawmaking process and contributing to the fall of the Fox North Coalition government in 1783, George felt entirely within his rights. To critics like Charles James Fox, though, this was evidence of the creeping influence of the Crown. If domestically George was seeking to flex the constitutional muscles of the monarchy, in the American crisis, it was the authority of Parliament that was at stake with the king describing himself as fighting the battle of the legislature. The American Revolution saw the clash of two great constitutional principles, parliamentary sovereignty and no taxation without representation. Parliament asserted its right to tax the colonies under the former, whilst the Americans resisted, citing the latter. In this dispute, George backed Parliament. He was deeply uneasy about making concessions regarding the Stamp Act, encouraged keeping the controversial tea duty and rejected the Continental Congress's Olive Branch petition. The latter, after all, came from an assembly his government did not recognise, and from men who had taken up arms against the Crown. According to Dickinson, though, once the conflict began, the King's role was less significant than has commonly been assumed. George was consulted on the conduct of the war, asked to approve plans, and at times was certainly influential, but he was not the key decision-maker. Dr. Stephen Parisian similarly describes George as relatively hands-off when you compare him with his European contemporaries, arguing, if the role of the sovereign is defined more as a job than as a right, then George III got the balance about right. This early impression of a constitutional monarchy, with George, a devoted and moral family man, father of the nation, the embodiment of plain-speaking John Bull, was an image the court promoted with great success. Farmer George, as he was later portrayed, took pleasure in walking the fields, tilling the soil, and tending to the animals of the two farms he established at Windsor. This became the royal family's principal residence and, according to the king, the place I love the best. <laughs>
a partaker of honest pleasures. According to William Thackeray, George liked to live frugally, breakfasting on dry toast and weak tea, preferring life on his country estates to the pomp of the court. Farmer George was no Philistine, though. The king was a leading patron of the arts, commissioning many of the greatest artists of the day and helping to establish the Royal Academy of Arts. He also greatly extended the royal collection when he purchased Buckingham House for his bride, Princess Charlotte. George greatly extended the future palace and filled it with art and the best in British design. Despite struggling with his homework as a boy, George was also passionate about physics, chemistry, mathematics and engineering, commissioning some of the most sophisticated clocks, barometers and watches ever created. He was also an avid collector of books, 65,000 of which were later donated to the British Museum, where a special room was purpose-built for the collection in 1827. George was also far from the simple ogre of American propaganda when it came to religious toleration. When a bill was proposed in Parliament to limit the licensing of Protestant dissenting preachers, George warned that such a measure would not obtain his sanction. There shall be no persecution in my reign. Such actions led the Methodist leader, John Wesley, to ask, when will England ever have a better prince? George also supported freedom of worship for his Catholic subjects in Quebec, much to the disquiet of American colonists. He was less sympathetic, though, when it came to the civil and political rights of his Catholic subjects in Ireland. When Prime Minister William Pitt proposed the removal of restrictions on Catholic rights, the King claimed to do so would violate his oath to uphold the Protestant faith. Catholic emancipation was therefore delayed until 1829. George also opposed the emancipation of an altogether different order of enslaved Africans. While he accepted legislation in 1788, 1806 and 1807 that regulated and then banned the trade in slaves, the King's opposition to the abolition of slavery itself helped ensure that emancipation could not become a ministerial measure. This denied it the weight of government support, despite Pitt being sympathetic to the cause, delaying such an act until 1833. George, clearly, was a more complex character than he is often remembered. His long reign undeniably saw the Crown exercise the still considerable power it retained. But there is little evidence to suggest the King's objective was absolute tyranny at home or over the colonies. While the war with revolutionary France witnessed a government clampdown on radicals calling for the reform of Parliament, George's popularity continued to grow. Facing the threat of invasion, the king was no longer seen as a constitutional liability, but as a bulwark against revolution. This is clear to see in the celebrations that marked George's golden jubilee in October 1810. The first royal event of this kind ever held in the modern era and a great popular success. As Dr. Parisian concludes, George grew into the role of father of his people in a manner none of his continental rivals could boast. His tragedy was that his mental illness prevented him from enjoying the fruits of his success. Mm -hmm.